for the sake of the demo, this is an image from uh, just Google. I just typed in uh, giraffe. So again, being mindful in terms of my picture plane, whether if it's working vertically or horizontally, I want to also keep that um, into consideration. Remember when you're really thinking about how to figure out um, cropping or sort of editing your actual picture plane, you could use your computer at this point to sort of be mindful and say, okay, do I want to edit a, as a uh, vertical composition or do I want it more as a horizontal composition? It's really up to you. Um, let's say, for example, if I sort of selected this um, picture plane as my actual image and being mindful of my actual drawing, uh, I also want to consider the fact that my uh, size on my sheet of paper, the 19 by 25 inch uh, dimensions, is actually um, calculated in consideration of my picture plane. So, for example, I can also crop this into the four. Let me zoom out a little bit. So I can sort of divide that into four and make individual picture planes. So for example, if this was my picture plane, I can kind of crop this into one square, right? You can, for example, for just for the sake of the, the demo, like this would be one. And obviously it's not roughly uh, that same calculation, but you can see, and this will be another, and this will be another, and here will be another here. So that's also another thing. But because the photograph is sort of given in a, a kind of uh, horizontal composition, um, I can also just change my orientation to that sort of format. So that's what I'm actually going to do for the sake of the demo. So if I divided this into four, right, I can also just make this sort of square right about here, right? And this will be my center line, okay? And I have a, another center line. Let's actually, for the sake of this demo, let's actually put that in there. So it help me un um, understand this sort of pictorial space of my actual image. So say for example, let's hold on, I need to make a straight line. Wait, that's not this selection tool, this one, yeah. So if I made a line right at the edge of my picture plane, right, right in the center, right? Make a horizontal line right about there. Need to lower this a little bit. And I made another, vertical line in the center, you know, you can calculate this with your aluminum 24 inch ruler. This actually helps as a guide, as a grid. So while I'm looking at my reference, I can start to think about if this is my size of my actual drawing, like this is my sheet of paper, okay? From edge to edge, corner to corner, I can now figure out what needs to be in this square, what needs to be in this square, what needs to be in this square, and what needs to be in this square. And that helps sort of eliminate the problem of figuring out my composition, right? Which makes it a lot simpler. You can, in theory, continue and start making more. For example, you can make a, another vertical line here and another one just dividing it in this center. And again, you will be calculating this much more accurately. And I can make another horizontal line here. And I can do this just with my graphite before I even get into some of those materials. And I'll make another line here. And that actually helps even more, okay? Obviously it's not quite as straight, I need to lower this, okay? So that also helps even further so within that process, what I can do, okay, is now look at my actual drawing and depending on my orientation, let me just move some of these materials. I can now calculate, let me just do that a little bit, this sort of picture plane. So what I've done here is sort of map out some tape on all four sides. And actually also, I can also take my ruler, right? And I can also calculate this and say, this is about a 19 and a half by it's about 13 and a quarter, okay? And I can also calculate that by just dividing the 19 and a half to two, okay? And then 13 and a quarter by uh, two as well. And again, you don't necessarily have to do this, but as for the sake of the demo, you can if you want to. So um, I would actually 
highly recommend doing this even before we even start, just for the sake of understanding how we can figure out the composition, which probably is the most difficult part of this assignment. Okay, let me just fix the orientation of this camera. Okay, uh, and that's exactly what we did for our previous drawing, which I'm going to show you now. This was that Jaguar that we did in the demo. And what I did is sort of divide it into the four, okay? So I just made a horizontal line here and then a vertical line here from edge to edge, okay? And within that process, I was able to figure out exactly how I can sort of uh, create my composition. Now, this was an earlier demo that we did uh, last quarter. You can see that vertical line, excuse me, a horizontal line here, and there's another vertical line in that center for the parrot. Obviously, this wasn't done completely in time, but just for the sake of the demo from last quarter, you can get to see both aspects within the drawing. Okay. Um, and what I would like to do also, too, and again, before I even start this iteration, um, on the back sheet of my paper, let me just move some of these materials. I can, in theory, and I have it here, which I'm actually get, just going to pull up. I've sort of created a like, very simplified uh, generalistic grid just with my graphite. Okay. And what I did here is sort of create a series of squares to figure out what's color, which colors work well with each other. Okay, and this goes back to the lecture when we're thinking about sort of uh, uh, primary, secondary, and tertiary colors, right? Thinking about what colors would work and complement uh, best for the actual assignment. And some of these squares, and again, this is only about five by uh, 12 inch uh, squares that I've sort of created. You don't necessarily have to do this, but for the demo, I really want you guys to start just ex being experimental in this process. And I do it again, I gotta apologize for the glare of the actual shadow of the camera that you can start to see, and again, I have my apple green as my primary color that I like to use uh, for any sort of iteration of, the, uh, of this process for this assignment. But what I did is sort of applied variations of uh, pressure on each square. So for example, I added a complementary orange to the screen within the blue and then vice versa added a complementary red to this apple green on this sort of square here. Added a little bit of true blue and blended it into the green, made some cross hatching, made some more swatches, added a little bit of white to this violet and blue. And then you can start to see areas in which you can start to really get experimental. Okay, so what I would highly recommend before you even start your sort of uh, drawing, your initial drawings, is start exploring some of the color palettes, okay? And what I mean by this is sort of looking at, let me pull out all these colors, just flattening them so we can start to see these materials. How in which we can start to have, um, and then sort of a initial uh, start in this process. So what do we like uh, ideally need to do? We need to sort of figure out the materials, okay? We're, so we are using our Prismas, Prisma color sets, which are available on your supply kits. Again, I see a lot of students struggling with the fact that the 24 inch pack, okay? Remember has two rows. So there's two rows underneath the pack. So that's something to keep in mind. Okay, because these are oil-based, and those of you who've purchased your supply kits, remember the fact that they also come with the blending tool. Now the blending tool, it looks like a nude color like this. It's not an actual color. This is what we use to blend, okay? And I notice I've, I've sort of sharpened both sides. I can utilize both ends, so that's something you can do itself. You can kind of see within the camera here, it's a little bit, a little bit unfocused. You can kind of see some of that area is a little bit it has a little bit of a pigment of a brown, almost a beige color. And on the opposite side, there's almost a different sort of color palette on that side as well, which is something that you need to uh, consider. Now, within this process, again, I have my set here and they're kind of in different sizes because I've sharpened multiple times. I do have my silver um, sort of uh, metal sharpener. I do have my white eraser, okay? And I have my blending tool. Okay, I really just want to take my time 
in this process and start just experimenting with my basic primaries, okay? So how do I do this? So what I like to do is sort of separate my blues. So I have my Caribbean light, my true blue, my, where is my indigo? My indigo blue, which is almost a dark blue. Okay, so I have a collection here. Now let's separate my yellows. I have, actually that's the color I was missing, yellow, excuse me. Okay, I have my yellow here. I have my Spanish orange, and then I have a peach. So these are my sort of my yellow palettes. And what I mean by yellows are kind of more my lights, okay? And now let's look at my reds. I have some crimson, okay? I have, and I can also put this next to my Spanish orange, which is a color I'm gonna use as a neutral, okay? I'm gonna just hold this as a separator. I have my poppy red and I have my standard orange, okay? So this is a sort of good palette to start off with, okay? Before I get into my secondary and my tertiary colors, because I wanna be able to blend some of these colors in order to create some of these palettes to something really exciting to do. So for example, and again, I have my paper towel. We're gonna to be sharpening a lot in this process. So remember to keep this in mind, okay? You guys can follow along in this process if you would like, but it's really up to you. Uh, really take your time, okay? Again, I like to use my paper towel on my base. So while I'm drawing, I can rest my hand on top of it or I can just sort of uh, apply some of my materials directly on there, okay? I'll take my sharpener. Oh, wait, hold on, there's something stuck. Let me get my exacto knife because there's something stuck in my sharpener. Bear with me. There you go. Thank you, exacto knife. Okay. Take my sharpener. Take my indigo blue, which is one of my darkest. I'm gonna get it nice and sharp. Okay. And I'm also gonna I'm gonna uh, sharpen some of my yellows. Okay. So I'm just take raw yellow. And these are the colors I'm gonna blend first, for example, okay? So what I'm gonna do on this sort of swatch here on the bottom where I listed number four, I'm just gonna gradually, just very lightly, blend in the entire square. Not applying too much pressure. This is really important, the amount of pressure that we use. Just very lightly cover the whole thing, okay? What I also need to do, and I'm actually gonna move the camera slightly closer so we can see it better, okay? You guys can see this clearly? Yep. Yeah. Yes. Perfect. What I'm also gonna do, okay, is apply a little bit of pressure down here you can start to see it. You, those of you following along, you can start to see it even further on the bottom corner, bottom left corner. Okay. And now I'm just gonna gradually take my yellow and I'm just gonna work from the top left, applying the same amount of pressure to make a green. Because if you incorporate bloom and yellow, you get a green. Notice how some of it went over. You can get that bright yellow because there is no blue underneath that uh, color, okay? On that sheet of paper. But then now if I apply the same amount of pressure on the dark, you get a nice sort of darker, almost turquoise um, green on that palette, okay? Which is interesting. But notice that some of those areas that if I applied a little bit more pressure, and I work from the, the sort of corner here, I'm applying a little bit more pressure. You can see how much lighter that became in relationship to what's in the middle, which is almost a sort of a medium sort of greenish blue, okay? And in, in that sort of concept, I want you guys to be mindful of what colors work well with each other, okay? Now, for example, the, we're just working with our primaries. 
if I do the same thing on the uh, right next to it and add a sort of a layer of this is now actually let's use let's actually use true blue. I'm gonna again use since this, these are oil based, you can erase. Okay, so it's something. So don't freak out about this process. So you can erase these swatches or, or these colors that you make. Just be mindful not to add too much pressure, because the more pressure that you add, the harder it is it's going to erase. Okay, just make a general swatch on that square. Take my yellow, go over it again, same amount of pressure. And you can see how different those are, right? One looks almost like it's under the ocean. The other one looks like it's on top of a uh, leaf, a fiddle fig leaf. And that sort of interesting concept is how we can explore these colors of what works best with the actual animal skin, fur, the texture, the sort of surface quality of the skin and so on and so forth. But then for example, if I take a peach and sort of work my way to the top here, what happens if I add a peach on that layer? Now we have three layers combined. It almost looks white. And this is a great base to work with a highlight. What happens if I take a little bit of the Spanish orange and work my way on the bottom here? I'm applying a little bit more pressure. You get an almost earthier yellow green, which is interesting, right? But then, for example, I'm now going to take some of my reds. Let me do this first. Sharpen my pencil. Okay. Let's now move the camera slightly right over here so the shadows don't get in the way. I'm now going to actually start off with my indigo. Make a swatch. What anytime when I say swatch, it's a sort of square, and it could be any shape to be honest with you, but just for the sake of the demo. We have a grid, so we're using it as square. Take my crimson red. Crimson red is a fantastic, almost blood red. Go over the entire thing. Same amount of pressure. And if you mix those two colors, you get a nice sort of orange violet color, which is fantastic. I'm gonna apply a little bit more pressure on the top here. And I'm actually gonna apply more pressure of the indigo blue on the bottom here. and see what colors come out. It almost has an orange tint, almost brown orange tint, which is interesting. And what's interesting about this concept, if I mix all three colors together, all three primaries, crimson, red, indigo blue, and yellow, I get brown. So it's something to, to factor in, okay? But then the same thing, if we added, let's say for example, a Caribbean blue, excuse me, not a Caribbean, a true blue, on this side, add a little bit more. I'm gonna add more pressure here. Notice how much lighter that became. It's pretty bright, which is fantastic. Let me just move my camera slightly. You can see how light that is, okay? But then if I go back and add some, let's add some crimson over that it changes to almost like a sort of lighter violet, almost plummy, bubblegummy color, which is interesting. And that's something you wanna sort of factor in in this process, okay? So we made four swatches in this, in this process. If I take my white, and this is where it gets interesting, I'm gonna gradually go over some of these areas. It almost dulls down a color. Now that's something you wanna keep in mind. You can see what happened here. It almost becomes almost like a fog. Let's do the same thing here. This also amplifies the lights. So if you have a high highlight on your animal, you can use some of the white gradually to sort of make that color come um, light, uh, become a lot lighter. But if I add too much white, it gets almost dulled down. Let's see if I add a little bit more pressure. Now it really starts to look like bubblegum. 
which is interesting. Now that's something to consider in this aspect. But if I do the same thing with black, this is where the problem lies with using black is it starts to look more illustrative, cartoony. And you do not want to use this within this assignment if you can. And a part of this, I want you guys to start exploring the colors as your darks, meaning let's see, let's see how, uh, what that means when we put it into practice. So what I'm gonna do, take my dark brown, okay? And I'm gonna start adding a layer here. And I'm actually gonna now incorporate a little bit of the indigo blue. And this is a great color to use in combination together, indigo blue and dark brown as a black. And the reason why is it, it has this nice natural shadow of the richness of the blues and the sort of the earthier uh, colors of the brown. So that is a wonderful black. I know it's a little bit harder to see in the camera, for those of you who put this into practice and make a swatch, I want you to create a swatch by using these two colors and make uh, a sort of blend of both to see what happens, okay? But now let's see if I actually did this, let's do the same thing on this swatch. I'm gonna actually add, add more pressure. I'm actually gonna apply more pressure. You notice I sort of went in this sort of direction. I'm gonna go the opposite direction here. Add a little bit more pressure. You could also see they feel somewhat different in terms of the sort of approaches. But if I went back and let's say, for example, added a white, it almost becomes a blue because the indigo blue is so dominating in terms of its color, right? There's a, almost like a coolish gray blue. And if I do the same thing here, it's sort of less noticeable because we didn't apply too much pressure, okay? So there's a really interesting jump between one to the other. But now let's see, let's say if I wanna start off with my basic color. So in terms of the palette, I always like to use my apple green, great flesh tone. It amplifies the, the sort of colors that we use on top of our actual um, animals. And I part of this assignment, I really want you guys to look at your hand and all of us have such beautiful skin tones on our skin that you can start to see greens and blues and violets and green uh, and like apple greens and browns throughout our entire hand. And the more and more you start to analyze this and start to really observe the sort of skin tones of a human figure, it's actually no different from a wild animal, okay? So the apple green is a wonderful base to work from. So I'm gonna make a swatch, okay? And let's see, I'm gonna add a indigo blue on top of that. And this neutralizes some of the harsher colors when we use our primaries, okay? So if I added a blue, it almost neutralizes that green and almost makes it much more manageable. I notice I'm sort of working in a circular motion. But then if I do the same thing, with my brown, let me sharpen this guy. Okay. You get a nice sort of almost earthy, earthier, more richer shadow. And I can always go back and let's see if I added a little bit more blue, indigo blues. and really blend those colors together. Okay, and it's a little bit hard to see obviously with this, uh, the camera, the angle of the camera, but you can start to see that sort of variation, okay? What I can't, you know, what I'm gonna do here is now, let's see if I added, a, uh, let's use a violet, 
for the sake of the dough, okay? We're now using a sort of a plumier violet. I'm gonna make a swatch. And I wanna make this a little bit more darker in terms of its color palette, in terms of its shadow, right? This color here. What I can do is take my violet and sort of make sort of a blend on this area. Blend these guys, these corners, the bottom left. It almost actually made it a little bit lighter. What happens if I add my indigo blue, which is a dark color on the side? There's a nice sort of blend between those colors, right? But what happens if I add my, let's actually add a complementary yellow. Let's see what happens. going over the entire thing. That almost turned green because there was blue on top of. This has this nice sort of almost earthier brown, which is interesting. But then if I go over on top of that even further with some white, you can see how gradually it almost becomes desaturated. So all that richness of color is almost lost and it becomes a gray, which is interesting. Okay, so for the sake of this demo, guys, I want you guys, if you can, start exploring some of these colors before you even start your drawings, okay? It's extremely important that you get the hand of the materials so you can really have fun and exp uh, experiment and start exploring some of the variations. I want you to blend multiple colors, multiple swatches, and if you have questions about it, please let me know so we can discuss it even further. Questions about swatches. Yeah, I have a quick question. Yes. Uh, is it worth it to explore it on white paper if I don't want to waste my limited black paper supply? Or should I definitely explore it on, on um, black paper? If you can, and that's Sophie? Yeah, that is me. Sophie, uh, Sophia, if you can, try to work on the back sheet of the tone sheet of paper. Okay. Uh, just so we can get familiar with this assignment and working with tone uh, cans and paper. The problem is if we, I mean, you can definitely explore it on your, uh, a Strathmore 18 by 24 inch drawing paper. Mm -hmm. The problem is, is, again, we don't see the richness or sort of the reaction of what happens when we work with tone sheets of paper. I know yeah. it's somewhat limited because we only have two sheets in our packs, but what you can do, again, I always tell this to my students uh, in terms of this process that you can always sort of divide your actual sheet of paper into four or into eight and make multiple swatches or multiple iterations before you start your entire sheet because that makes it much more manageable that makes sense sophia yeah. yeah but i mean i'm not gonna hold that against anybody if they uh sort of want to work uh, with their straft more um it's really up to you but you'll see what happens once you start exploring too much of white sheet of paper you sort of get um uh used to it uh, and the problem is when you get to your tone sheet of paper, it almost becomes like a sort of surprise. It's like, uh oh, what am I going to do now? I'm not sort of familiar in this process because I haven't explored it yet in terms of the demo or in terms of the drawing. Uh, but I'm going to leave that up to you. Okay. Let me now switch to my, where is my paper? I'm just going to move some of these sheets. Okay, so now I do have, I wonder if I should make this a little bit smaller so you guys can see it better. Actually, we'll go from there. Now, what I do, I have my ruler. Where's my apple green? So again, again, guys, as a rule of thumb, try to work with your apple green first for any sort of sketch, preliminary drawing, or draft before you get into other colors. So keep this in mind. I know I do apologize, guys. The, the image quality is a little bit, um, it's actually, it's, it's really not that great. But, and I do apologize in advance. But just for the sake of the demo, I'm actually gonna divide my uh, sheet of paper into a half. So that's right about. I'm using my apple. I have another quick question really quickly. Just sorry, before you get started. Go ahead, okay. 
Okay, sorry. Uh, oh. So my oh. kit didn't come with a blending thing. I don't know if it was supposed to. Is there something I should use instead, or is that necessary? I should um, mention that. The, the, bell, the blending tool should have came with a supply kit. I can double check that. If you do need one, just let me know. Uh, you can, I mean, um, you could also just purchase it uh, from Blick separately, but um, you don't necessarily have to use it. Mm -hmm. uh, it is a great tool to use if you have uh, more of a reptile or more of a sort of uh, scaly or animal, um, but it's not necessarily um, uh, enforced. So it's really up to you if you want to use it or not. It's a great sort of tool to use once you're blending some of the feathers or some kind of, kind of the harder shapes on the surface of an animal. And I can use that for the demo. Uh, yeah, is there an alternative that I could, I don't know. Like, I, mean, I assume I, fingers aren't a great idea, but. Well, I've seen students use um, Q-tips. Okay. And you could, you could use a paper towel. The thing is, because it's oil-based, um, I've actually seen students also use baby oil to sort of mm -hmm. blend with some of their fingers so they can use the grease of their fingers and kind of blend some of those areas. It's not like charcoal, mm -hmm. where it's much more tactile and much more physical. You can just sort of make a smear or make a mark and it removes or subtracts it. But um, I'm trying to think, you could also use a brush, a okay. synthetic bristle or um, synthetic brush if, if you can. Um, but I can try to find other alternatives and I can actually post that on the Canvas modules just for the sake of the demo. Um, but unfortunately, if you don't have it, it's just a little strange. It should have been in the supply kits. I can double check on that and I'll contact uh, Blick to see what's going on. But, um, uh, Sorry, just uh, mine didn't come with one either in case that was a common problem with them. Hmm. Same. That's interesting. I do apologize, guys. Um, I mean, what I can, I mean, the only thing we can do because of time is that I can try to see if we can have access to a blending tool um, this week. But if not, um, you guys don't necessarily have to go out and buy one. But um, just for the sake of the of this assignment. Um, if you do need one, shoot me a message, shoot me an email, and I can try to um, find some time and we can try to schedule something if you if you desperately need one. I'll try to send one to individuals if they if they do want to explore the blending tool. Um, but if not, it's completely okay. You don't necessarily have to use it. Uh, it's a great tool to use just for the sake of sort of blending some of the areas, but it's not required. Let's just say that. But if uh, other students are missing them, this is not a good thing. And that's something I need to look into a little bit further. Okay. And I apologize, guys. Yeah, this should be in those supply kits. But if not, I'll look into it. Um, any other questions? Okay. I do have, I'm just going to draw my materials here so you can have, there you go. You can kind of. Use it on the first. Those pencils won't move. Okay, so I do have my 19 by 25 inch Canson uh, Nero black sheet of paper. I sort of divided it into four, just for the sake of figuring out the composition. And again, this is, you don't necessarily have to do that if you don't want to, but it really helps you sort of understand and sort of figure out the entire composition of your animal, and it gets it becomes much more manageable which is really, really important. Uh, questions before I start? Okay. So again, I do, I'm using the giraffe as my preliminary drawing. There's sort of wonderful color variations within the portrait. And what I like to always recommend everybody to use, try to use your apple green um, as your preliminary draft for the drawing, just to figure out the composition. Uh, again, I like to work lightly in this process, in this uh, beginning stage. I don't want to be too aggressive. I don't want to have sort of aggressive marks throughout my drawing. So if I made any mistakes, I can start erasing. Okay. So what I want to do is sort of sharpen my apple green, get sharp. Okay. And then what I now like to do is sort of see like, let me pull up my the actual image. Okay. So within this, so I have this sort of divided into halves. I do notice these squares are slightly bigger. What I'm going to do is actually make another 
And I can't see what you guys are seeing. So if you guys can't have trouble seeing, just let me know. And then I'll sort of adjust my camera. Make this slightly. And I'll, and that's, that's a pretty good composition. So what I'm gonna do sort of remove some of the tape. Actually, add it to the bottom. So I have a nice sort of area in which, and again, it's not measured, which is okay. And that's roughly good. Okay. okay, so I'm now looking at my photo reference. I do notice that part of the composition, let me just adjust this camera size. Um, is almost covering the entire sheet, to be honest. So what I like to do is hold my pencil in a very sort of gestural composition in the center, and kind of in the middle half, and just roughly start thinking about making some marks. I'm just gonna gradually make some circles and figure out, let's like, say, for example, like here's my eye, which my eye is right about here. Here's my ear, and the ear is almost halfway through this sort of square, okay? Goes right about there. Here is the sort of the beginning half of the head, which is right about here is that sort of, um, I don't know if giraffes have horns. I'm just going to just add that in there. And actually, it actually comes out a little bit further. So it's right about here. And I want to be really loose, making really abstract marks. I don't want to be focused on Focusing on detail, I don't want to worry about any of that. That's where that arch is in terms of the head. Actually, the eye is slightly lower. And there's the lid of the eye. Here's my ear. Here's the sort of the jaw lined, starting to begin on that side. And it arches it down there. Here's the sort of the cheek. Again, it's roughly made, so I can go back. I'm gonna add a little bit more pressure just to refine some of my composition. Here's the socket of the other eye. Anywhere, that's, this is where the sort of the mouth begins. And between like halfway of this square, I notice that's where the mouth ends. It's right about there. Again, not worrying about detail. It should look messy. It should look chaotic. It should look all over the place, which is a great thing because a part of this process you'll start to see is the more looser we work is really you know, allowing yourself to kind of get a little bit more freer in terms of just kind of not focusing on too much details. Just thinking about what's important and trying to figure out the composition first, okay? I'm noticing the ear is slightly bigger here, lowering this area. Now I can start to see my bottom. Actually, this line is a little bit lower. I'm just noticing that right now because I'm just figuring out the more and more I'm looking at my, and again, I think measure this, which is okay. I'm just gonna lower this slightly because I notice this square is slightly bigger, which would mean that this area is slightly, there you go, yeah, right about here. That's where the bottom here, the mouth, that's where the neck of the giraffe runs right about here. I'm gonna erase this line because I don't need it. And I can erase in these preliminary drafts because I can make some mistakes. I can always go back and start to fix some of those areas. Okay. Now this is the socket of the eye. This is the ear. So that's sort of almost sort of forehead. And now notice I'm sort of moving my way upwards to my tip of my actual um, pencil, of my actual green. And I can start refining some of these areas. 
This is sort of where the value will be in terms of some of those darks and lights, composition of the eye. Add a little bit more pressure. That's where that socket will be. And then there's sort of variations between some, some of those shadows here. And I like to kind of work my way back and forth because I can start to see it a little bit more clearly. This is the neck, which is right about there. This is where that jawline will be. This is where the spots are. I'm just really working loosely, not worrying about any details yet because the more you start to focus on those details, the less you start to focus on what's important. This is where that sort of nostril will be. This is the other nostril. Okay. Now I'm working on underneath the mouth. There's almost like a separation between how wide this is in terms of color. I wanna put that in there just sort of indicate that that's where it begins and ends. This right about there. And within that, start to see where my ear, excuse me, not the ear, what is it? The side of, the side of the eye. Within that, I can start to lower this down. And I can figure out that measurement of that foreshortened in terms of how wide this is. It actually comes slightly lower. Okay. But then now I can look at the, almost the brow of the giraffe. to fill this in. And I like to fill it in almost like looking at it as like a model. So I'm like sort of sculpting those sides. Bring out the ear. And now working my way back here. I'm gonna sharpen my pencil a little bit on the side. And again, just worrying about the general composition. I'm not worrying about my lights or my darks. I don't need to at this stage. So where my eye is. That's right about it less than halfway. Okay. See how these beautiful large lashes, which is interesting. Within that, there's that sort of almost loop and there's more lashes. And interesting, it's interesting because the more and more I'm starting to analyze the animal, I can start to notice things that I didn't notice prior. And I think a part of this process is really exploring your reference and figuring out what you see and how we see it, which is important. I'm noticing this is way too large and you make that lower. And I can start erasing some of those areas I don't need. Okay. Oops, sorry, my paper seems to be moving constantly. Noticing there's more sort of it's wide. It's an eyelid is slightly wider. This is slightly foreshortened, which I can also. There you go. There's my eye. Notice that this is where that sort of, that sort of ear would be here where the areas of the shadow will be. I'm just sort of mapping that out in terms of that composition. And now I can start to add a 
more pressure? What questions do we have? Again, guys, I can't see any hands. Just feel free to speak anytime. Questions? No questions, okay. I almost like to look at this almost as in a, as in a painting format because I want to be a little bit more looser. Sort of make these sort of harsher marks to see where those hair follicles or how the sort of muscles and wrinkles bend and curve. And I wanna sort of explore that even further if I can. Very abstract, remember, not worrying about these details. Let's see where those nostrils will be and this right about. But here, there's almost, there's a sort of elongation. I can erase some of these areas, just to sort of refine those areas. but always be mindful that the more pressure I add, the harder it is it's gonna erase, which is okay. And there's almost like sort of a lip down here. We can kind of see the underneath the cheeks, underneath the, the neck, and then the sort of larger spots of the giraffe. And almost looking at this sort of process as like a skeleton, which is important because you start to understand more about the composition, refining some of the areas, darkening some of the areas. And within that, just erase my green, becomes much more manageable. There's also a little horn here. This almost looks like it looks like a unicorn. Like there's a top right about here. You can start to look at the reference that separates that and that's fascinating. And that's right about here. And there's almost a sort of a gradient. So I'm gonna actually fill that in just side of my graphite, excuse me, side of my prisma. And then now I can start to let's see. Now this is a little too wide. I'm gonna make this smaller. That's that size, and this is a little bit more. It looks like it's like arching, arching downwards. It's interesting, the animal looks like it has like strange horns. It's beautifully made. I mean, it's just like how it's photographed. But you have this wonderful sort of three quarters composition. And I noticed like almost in this area here in this picture plane on that sort of shadow, that's where, that's where you'll find some dark sort of browns. And then here I'm gonna add some more. There's the sort of lashes. This is where that sort of side will begin and end. Okay. Now, when I'm happy with this sort of process and say, you know what? Okay, this is a sort of good preliminary draft. I can now start to think about areas within the drawing where I can start adding some darks. Okay, so how does this look? I, mean, I can't see what you guys are seeing. Okay, this looks good. Sort of air in the back, which I'm just noticing now. The spots. Let's 
to these areas, and I'm not going to erase any of this. I want to see all of these sort of abstract marks. Okay. And in this stage, it looks really strange, but really trust this process because the more you start to go back and start adding some darks, you'll start to see what happens. So let's add some darks now. What I'm gonna do is just uh, put my apple green on the side. There's my sharpener. Start sharpening my indigo blue. And I'm gonna start adding a layer and it just, just gradually start adding some layers of my darks within my composition, okay? Let me see if the... I'm I noticed some of these areas, which I saw before. I'm gonna use my side of my indigo blue, start blending some of these areas. And you wanna work gradually from dark to light. Gradually, you're gonna add some more shadows in there. More, you're gonna go over your apple green. And there's almost a sort of brownish sort of forehead in that sort of uh, area here. So I'm gonna add a layer of the blue on top of that. I'm actually holding it very, very lightly, just gradually using this side there's also a sort of a shadow here, in this sort of area. And I'm noticing, let me just pull up my reference a little bit closer. Those areas of the, of the eye socket are almost as a pitch black, sort of bluish brown. So I'm gonna add a layer of blue, but add another layer of blue here. I'm also going to work my way around the socket because it almost looks like there's sort of a, a shadow underneath, what is it called, um, the, uh, the iris of the eye, as well as the sort of the pupil. But then underneath the eyeball, there's sort of a gradient. And I want to sort of blend some of those areas together. Just make a value underneath that. I also noticed there's sort of values within those areas of the ear. But I wanted to actually, before I get into that, I'm gonna add a value of the apple green over the entire thing of the ear. Do the same thing here, just kind of get a, a nice value. And then I'm gonna go back. And again, because it, it's a great neutralizer, neutralizes these colors together. Add some blue on top of that green. So when I go back and add some browns, it'll be a little bit darker. And this is how you wanna work gradually, okay? We're not worrying about those details, We're not worrying about the entire images uh, light source yet, because we wanna work with the light source last, okay? And I notice here, sort of the mouth nostril area, there's a kind of a gradient of a dark. And I want to work in that sort of way in terms of figuring out my darks first, because once I add my middle tones and my lights, these colors will magically appear consistent and precise towards my reference, okay? It would look exactly like the sort of furry forehead or the sort of scaly kind of areas on this sort of uh, axis in terms of where the light will start to sort um, be amplified on that angle. But then what I'm gonna do now is take my dark brown. Again, always working with your darks first. And how to make a black is you add a little, oh, it's actually really sharpened well. Um, you take your dark brown and you take your indigo. And I'm gonna go back to my eye socket. And I notice there's almost like a violet color. The more and more I'm starting to understand the color at a layer. I'm gonna actually work around. Add another layer here. And I'm also gonna take some crimson red. And I wanna make a nice sort of deep violet earth brown. So what you what you we can do is add some crimson on top of that and a thin layer of a crimson. Okay, and then add another thin layer of a crimson. 
And then I'm gonna take my indigo. I'm actually gonna sharpen it even further. Remember your sharpener is your best friend. You want your pencils to be nice and sharp so it's easier for you to blend. And I'm just gonna refine some of this area add a little bit more pressure because I know that's my dark and I'm actually going to go over the in some of these areas gradually there's almost a gradient in my in the socket of the eye sorry if my head was in the way I do apologize I'm trying to see it my image a little bit clearly Okay, and I'm now gonna take my true blue. I'm gonna sharpen it, put it on the side. Take my blush or my peach. Is this peach? Yes, it is. And I'm gonna actually add some middle middle tone lights noticing my actual reference so around right about here here's a nice sort of gradient value but there's also a nice gradient value here and around that socket on the top lid is kind of a coolish color there's more coolers colors down here okay and I'm also now going to add a little bit more peach as my light. Go over that area. Notice there's a reflection of something. I'm adding a little bit of pressure, just a little bit. Kind of neutralize that blue and I can I was going to say I can zoom in so we can see this a little bit clearly let me zoom in even further is that better there you go okay and then now I'm going to go back here oh my hand can't fit <laughs> it's my blush There's more on this side. Okay, take a little bit of my apple green. Again, your apple green is a great neutralizer of all these colors. You wanna make it less of that sort of bright blue. So the apple green sort of almost blends those colors together. And then if I take a little bit of my brown over that area like a wash like a light sort of value and then go back with my indigo can't see from my my camera and then i'm going to add more darks a little bit more pressure and i'm just working with my eye socket Okay, but then now what I can do is add some white. And this is really done last, ideally, but just for the sake of the demo. You kind of see the color relationships that we used. And just be mindful of how much light I add. Some of that tip broke off, so I need to be mindful of that. It's a gradual highlight there. My pencil's breaking, and I apologize for that, because it shouldn't be breaking.
light in this area here. And then there's more lights on this side. I'm gonna move my lights. And I'm actually gonna neutralize this with some Spanish orange. Okay, let me get my sharpener. I notice there's more like sort of almost earthier colors in there. Add a layer around. But then, a layer of that dark indigo. Just gradually start blending some of these areas. Take my brown, go over some of those areas, get a nice rich black. And then I can take my Spanish orange, go on top of that, just to warm it up. And then now I'm noticing there's more blush, sort of lighter colors over here. And notice this blush will act as a light. Without using white. You can always go back and add, I'm actually add some blush here in the socket of the eye around, excuse me. But within all of this, you can then now go back at the final stages. You'll do this obviously later. You'll add some whites. Now I like to follow the hair follicle lines of which direction the hair is going. Gradually blend those two colors together. You get this nice rich layers of color. Okay, questions. There was a lot of colors we just added on those areas. What questions do we have? Okay, let's go back to the animal. So this took about how long? 15 minutes, right? Something around there. This assignment should take around at least a few hours, okay? This will probably be the most time consuming assignment for the entire quarter. I'll work on this a little bit further. I'll leave this here for now and then we can come back and if we have any questions, uh, you can ask me uh, after class, um, but I'll actually keep working on this until it's finished. And then I will actually post what we have done for our class by the end of uh, tonight. Okay. Let me 